Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, welcome to this session. It's called Darkness is All Around Us, Horror Fiction That Feels Quite Real. Uh, I'll be your moderator, moderator today. My name is Michael Schaub. I am a journalist based in Georgetown, Texas. I review books for NPR, and I report on the publishing industry and literature for Kirkus Reviews. Um, I'm also a native of San Antonio, born and raised here, and so it's great to be virtually uh, back in my hometown. Um, I am lucky today to be joined by two really wonderful authors, uh, Mariana Enriquez and Stephen Graham Jones. Uh, a little about them. Uh, Mariana is a writer and an editor. She's based in Buenos Aires. Uh, she contributes to a number of newspapers and literary journals, both fiction and nonfiction. Uh, her latest short story collection is titled The Dangers of Smoking in Bed, and it was recently named to the 2021, 2021 International Book Group Prize long list. So congratulations, Mariana. Thanks. And uh, Stephen has been an NEA Fellowship recipient. He's won the Jesse Jones Award for Best Work of Fiction from the Texas Institute of Letters, the Independent Publishers Award for Multicultural Fiction, a Bram Stoker Award uh, for This Is Horror Awards, and he's been a finalist for the Shirley Jackson Award and the World Fantasy Award. Um, his latest book is titled The Only Good Indians. And he is the Ivina Baldwin Professor of English at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, before we begin, we begin, I would like to urge you to consider purchasing these books, these excellent books from Nowhere Bookshop, great bookstore in Alamo Heights. They are the, uh, the book festival's bookseller. And as you know, independent bookstores have had a really hard time uh, during the pandemic. And so, uh, we really hope you'll support them and support these writers by ordering the ordering these books. Just click on the buy the book button on the festival website. And also, if you have any questions uh, for uh, Mariana or Stephen, please place them in the Q&A box. You will see that on the top right of your screen. Uh, and we'd love to hear some questions from you all, so please feel free to do that. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, Mariana, I'd like to, to begin with you. Um, the Dangers of Smoking in Bed is such a, a delightfully creepy short story collection. Uh, there's stories about witches and curses and a, a seriously scary one involving a Ouija board. Um, is, there, would you, is there a common theme, would you say, that's present that runs through all the stories in, a, in, the, in the collection? I think that's my first short story collection, so I wasn't really thinking I mean, it's the latest translated, but it's the first one I published. So I wasn't really thinking as I would think now, more in terms, you know, of a, a theme or, or something like that. But what I was really trying to do in that in that collection was something that, you know, I always wanted to write horror. And up to that point, that collection is from 2009, I couldn't. Um, there were two things I couldn't do. One was writing horror. I had two realistic novels before that are quite grotesque, let's say, but not the horrific events, but it's not genre. I wanted to write genre. And um, and I couldn't write female narrators. My narrators were men, most of them. And I think that it's, you know, only normal because I've read more female narrators. Doesn't mean authors, narrators is a different thing more male narrators than female narrators. So it's absolutely, you know, normal that the first thing I try to do is it's male narrator. And also I think the writer is kind of androgynous. So I, I'm not really bothered about that. But I felt that was a problem because I wanted to do voices of women and the women really sounded like me. They were awful or they were very wooden and, you know. So I really tried to say, okay, let's do women and let's do horror and whatever. And then if I don't like it, I throw them away. I'm not very precious about my, my things. So if there's a theme, the theme is really trying to give voice to women in different situations and, uh, and politics. That's something that maybe we can uh, go more later not maybe as obvious as in in other collections of mine or other books of mine but in some stories very very obviously horror and horror especially from you know uh realistic latin american sources yeah absolutely do you think that women are underrepresented in horror fiction yeah 
but that's very obvious too. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean, there's amazing writers of horror that have been like for me. Uh, Lisa Tuttle was very important. Not so much uh, the the tech or Shirley Jackson. Shirley Jackson was important as also with the text, also with the novels. Um, but some women with the attitude and, and stuff. And now I really like, I don't know how to pronounce her first name, but Game of Files. I really like her. In the, I mean, in, in the, in the you know, uh, English writing tradition, because, you know, people that are listening to us were are more familiar. But I think Flannery O'Connor is a horror writer. To me, the horror thing, it's a very wide thing, too. So, um, but yeah, they are underrepresented in, in, in the genre, but, but I think that's very, this changing a bit also with the widening of the genre, there's many authors that you can put there. Like, for example, there's, a, there's an Argentinian writer that's been in the Chill Jackson thing and, you know, kind of things, so is Samantha Schwebling. I don't think yeah. anybody would think of Samantha as a horror writer here. But that has to do also with the... Um, it's a market thing. We don't have, we, our market is smaller, so there's not that many boxes. It's more, you know, mixed. So we are more writers of the weird, of the fantastic, it's wider. Yeah. So we find these um, little passages there. But I, I like to be called a writer of horror, even if I'm not strictly one. Like I, I do other things and I write other things, but I'm not, I have no problems with, with the label I like. It. That's great. And uh, Stephen, the, the only good it needs is, is such a, a great novel. It's one of the scariest novels I've read. Um, can you talk about how the idea uh, for this book came to you? Yeah, I guess it was slow. Um, back in 07, November of 07, I was up on the reservation hunting, got a big cow elk. And what I always tell the animals that I get is that um, I promise them that this was terrible, but it'll feed my family. You know, none of you is going to go to waste. It's all for the good. It's not just sports. And um, and I usually have always kept that promise. But then, like the March or the April after that, after I got that cow elk, she was still mostly in the freezer, and I suddenly had to move to Colorado, and you can't take a chest full of meat with you. And um, so I went up and down my street giving away packets of elk meat to everybody, and. Uh, moved on to Colorado and I got up to Colorado and I started thinking, um, those people on the street don't trust me. They I could I could have been giving them raccoon meat, you know, they don't know <laughs> nothing. And um and so I assumed or I, I feared I guess that some of them just fed it to their dogs or gave it away. And um that meant to me that I had broken my promise to that cow elk, you know? And so as for the premise for the novel, that's probably where it comes from, just from guilt for me. But as for the trigger for the book, um, my wife and I had moved into a new place that had a high ceiling and it had this spotlight up there that would not uh, um, react to any light switch, any electrical outlet, anything. It would come on at random times. And my wife and I are both real spooky. You know, we do things like we moved into a house once and we found a doll that scared us. And so we wrapped it in plastic and then duct tape and we buried it in the backyard and we were always terrified. We had to move out of that house before too long because we can't handle that kind of stuff. And so we're really scared of the spotlight. We never figured out. We moved out of the house too. Um, but I was up on the ladder trying to make that light work once and uh, looked down through the blades of the ceiling fan, which I'd stupidly left on. And I wondered, um, what rate are they spinning at? Is it the same rate that um, film spins at like 20, 26 frames per second to, to make, to get the illusion of motion into our heads. And I thought, what can I be seeing? You know, what would I, what can I see through the top of a ceiling, but ceiling fan? Cause we never look at them from that angle. We look at them from below if we look at them at all. And so I sat down and I just started, I wrote that scene that, that used to be the first scene of the novel is the main, one of the main characters, Lewis standing on top of the ladder, messing with the light, looking down through a ceiling fan and seeing something from his past, you know, that's great. And so that was just together the genesis of the, uh, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's such a great mm -hmm. scene too, a powerful scene. Um, and uh, Mariana, you kind of touched on this a, a, a little bit or, or when talking about politics, but one of the stories in the book, uh, your book mentions the, the thousands of people who were disappeared, the, the desaparecidos during Argentina's uh, Guerra Sucia, the, the dirty war. Um, what do you think, it, it's a really effective story, and what do you think 
makes horror as a genre such an effective uh, tool for talking about, in, in this case, Argentina's political trauma, but, you know, political trauma maybe in general? I think horror first is very good with trauma and with uh, processing trauma um, in general. And why not in politics too? And um, also, in, in, in particular, in, in, in Argentina, there was something phantasmagoric about what happened those years. I mean, Argentina had many dictatorships. That one in particular had many dead, and it was very violent, but there were no bodies. The, 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 the decision of the, of the junta, of the three generals that were the, you know, the, the dictators who were to remove the bodies, and the, the bodies are missing until today. This, this is m more than 40 years. So that kind of created ghosts. And also it's a bit of an exorcism, I guess. Of course, horror has an element of entertainment. And um, to treat, to me, to treat entertainment seriously, to treat, treat entertainment as, as what it is, that is something that, you know, can take people away from horrific realities and put them in, in, a, in a different reality and using that to also do some kind of uh, processing of trauma and, and, and exorcism, but respecting the, you know, in a way, the, the tropes and the rules of horror, like that story, for example, is a very political story, but it's teenage girls with a Ouija board. It's, you know, in, in a way, it's, it's as, as plot and atmosphere is nearer to the craft, but in spirit is missing, you know. So th that kind, I, I think also that that kind of uh, contamination of things, um, it's very useful in, in, a, in a disrespectfully good way, you know, like, taking sometimes things to look at things in the eye you think to, you need to take the solemn out of it and you know get it back to the everyday so i think horror as is uh, in a way is inherently disrespectful in a way i don't know how to put it but it can be very wild and it can be very brutal and i think that that uh, particularly helps with 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 politics it, it, it strangely makes our conversation about it more honest, to me at least. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, kind of tying into that, uh, I read an interview with you in Literary Hub, and you talked about uh, when you were younger, you were interested in psychogeography. Uh, do you believe that, you know, not just Argentina in particular, but that places in general can be um, haunted, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, by things that happened in the past? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. And um, I think that's what, for example, that gives all the the, um, the 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 kind of morbidness to Southern Gothic, for example. Mm -hmm. Like I read Faulkner sometimes. I'm, I'm not American. I have no relation to it. And there's something about reading those kind of writers that speaks to me about a land that is um, haunted. When you read, I don't know, Beloved by Toni Morrison, that to me is a very gothic novel and almost, I can say a horror novel, but very, like now it's very trendy to say elevated horror. <laughs> um, you can see what I'm talking about. You know, yeah. that, that, that ghost, that girl that came from this tragedy. It's not just, of course, it's, it, 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 uh, you know, it's a world tragedy and atrocity more than tragedy. Tragedy is another thing. Uh, it's something that men do, that men did. But I mean, um, that notion of a land that is haunted, a land that is damned, a, damned, a land and a people that did something that cannot be forgotten and cannot be forgiven and will forever be like that, um that notion yes of all the notions of psychogeography that is not just that but that one it's something that to me it's uh it's really relevant and um and it's really literary in a way 
-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Stephen, one of the, the coolest things about your novel, one of my favorite things, was that it's it's like this really clever spin on the slasher genre, basically. it's uh, In fact, early in the book, one of your, your characters actually mentions the phrase uh, final scroll, which seemed to me like it was maybe a shout out to uh, to the, the slasher genre. Did you write this book as, as kind of a tribute to that genre or, you know, how much of it was influenced by, you know, slasher films and, and that kind of thing? Probably about 110% of it was influenced <laughs> by slasher films. Um, what I wanted to do, um, I was in some interview and somebody asked me, what's the next thing you want to write? And I said, I want to write a Jason Voorhees novel, Friday the 13th novel, but I can't because that's licensed properties, you know? So I can't publish that. I could write it, but I couldn't publish it. And so I like noodled on it a bit, like, what can I do? What can I do? And I thought, I'm just going to take Jason Voorhees to the reservation and see what happens to him, you know, put him, put him and get somebody up there. But I can't use a hockey mask. And um, because I can't use a hockey mask, I had to give um, my entity a different mask. And so I gave them an elf mask, you know. And so, yeah, it was 100 um, percent shaped by the slasher. And, you know, to tell you the truth, um, when I wrote the novel, um, the scene that it opens with now with Ricky Boss Ribs dying in that parking lot um, of that bar, which hopefully it's not too big of a spoiler. And, um, that was initially came about halfway through the novel. And when I was revising it, um, I realized I can put this chapter one chapter ahead or one chapter behind and nothing changes. And, you know, I was like, oh, no, this is terrible. Because when you have a free floating chapter, then something's broken, you know, then it's not dominoes falling anymore. It's just things floating around everywhere. And so I, what I did was I went back to the scaffolding of the slasher genre and I asked myself, what are the um, the the bells the slasher has to ring as it runs along its route, its story route? And the first bell it has to ring is that initial opening blood sacrifice where a couple of random people die for you don't know why, you don't know how, but you see them get it. You know, that's how Friday 13 always start. And so, so I just took the book and I like tilted it over and that Ricky piece slid all the way to the front and now it's the prologue. And so the slasher genre i mean i set out to write a slasher and then the slasher helped me like um correct the novel as well you know and what i wanted to interrogate a lot of things about the slasher like i've always been uncomfortable with how the slasher um like objectifies and then disposes of women's bodies you know it's just it, it, it's it, a lot of people call it misogynistic and i think a lot of them actually are but um and so i decided let's make the target victims here all men you know men in their 30s instead of 17 year old girls and um and also i was always really uncomfortable with um at the end of a slasher the final girl when she goes up against the slasher she has to um adopt conventionally male characteristics to beat the slasher it's like who has enough muscles to exhibit these battleship skills not battleship battle battlefield skills i guess battleship skills would be helpful too but um of swinging a machete the hardest you know who can swing the machete the hardest that's the person who wins and i'm glad she wins that final girls are a model for us all they stand up to bullies but i i never was comfortable with how she kind of has to cash in her identity in order to win the day you know how she has to become kind of male to win the day and so i tried to rig the story such that my final girl could um face the slasher not with muscles but with the skills she's had her whole life which are basketball and compassion you know and that's the the weapons she wields against the slasher instead of having to put on armor and muscle up you know yeah absolutely and that, i kind of want to ask you about uh the, 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 the title of your book kind of seems like it has you know at least two meanings there's obviously it's uh mm -hmm. Part of the, the the awful quote from Philip Sheridan, uh, but or Teddy Roosevelt, depending on, on who you ask. But um, mm -hmm. it, it it also seems to be an undercurrent for several characters in the book, maybe maybe especially, but uh, maybe not uh, Lewis and Denora. So so how did you come to to title uh, come at the title of this book? Was it the, what kind of resonance does it have for you? Well, I came at uh, very reluctantly is how I came to it. Um, um, what happened? I wrote the novel. It was called Where the Old Ones Go, which I thought was wonderful. I gave it to my agent and she said, that's actually terrible. And so she retitled it Elkhead <laughs> Woman. And, um, I thought, well, there is an Elkhead Woman in it. Maybe that fits, you know, and she's the one who has to sell it. So she has to believe in it. So I let her, so we called it Elkhead Woman and she sent it out and it sold. And then I rewrote it for the editor and got it all in shape. And at the very end, the editor, Joe Monty at Saga, he said, now about this title dot 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 which is terrible you know you don't like to hear that <laughs> <laughs> and um 
and and he said, Let, let's find a tile that works. And I was like, I, I said, I'm lost. I don't, know what, I don't know what to call this book anymore. And he said, well, think of something. And so I started hitting them with titles. And the one I liked was Duck Lake Massacre, because this happens on Duck Lake, kind of on the reservation. He said, we're not going with Massacre, because Massacre stays on the horror shelf. It doesn't actually go to any other shelves, you know? And that's he's, he's right. He knows he knows how publishing and book selling works and all that. Um, and we went through a lot more titles. He didn't think any of them were good. And finally, I decided to take the middle section out of this book, the title of the middle section, which is Sweat Lodge Massacre, and move it to the front. And then I had to call the middle section something, and I thought, I'll just call it The Lincoln Indians. And I, told, I pitched that to him, and he said, that's the title, The Lincoln Indians. And I was like, whoa, whoa, um, I'm not going to call this book The Lincoln Indians, because I was really terribly afraid that, um, oh, I guess, to, like Dave Chappelle, when Dave Chappelle, that story he tells about quitting the Chappelle show, he says he was doing he was like in minstrel makeup and he was doing some um you know funny dance in a, in a comedy sketch and 30 people are in are watching him in the production crew and 29 of them are laughing and the 30th one is laughing too he's back in the corner but he's laughing in a different way you know in a way that was not in sync with what Chappelle was trying to do and I, that's what i was worried about that the only good indians i might be reading it to a room of 100 people or talking about it with them 99 of them might be with me, but there might be that one person back in the corner who's like, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, you know? And I'm um, some like seventh cavalry carryover or something. And um, I was worried that I was going to be seeding this terrible phrase back into the world and giving people license to say it, you know? And so it took a couple of weeks. I asked a lot of my friends, what about this title? And they said, yeah, it's a gamey title, but um, it also is good if it organically comes from the novel. So I looked back through the novel, and, and you're right, Michael, that the characters are always interrogating, interrogating themselves. What does it mean to be a good Indian? Does it mean adopting traditional ways? Does it mean being successful off the reservation? Does it mean marrying Indian, marrying white, marrying whoever? And, um, and what they find is that every way that you're an Indian is a way to be a good Indian. You know, there's seven million ways to be a good Indian because that's how many of us there are. And so I did finally go with that title. And the the editor, Joe Monty, he's a lot smarter than me. He was right. That is a good title to have on the book. But it took a lot of struggle for me to get there finally. Yeah. Yeah, I would imagine it's such a loaded phrase, but uh, I think it suits mm -hmm. the, the book so well. Um, Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, Marianne, I wanted to ask you that uh, a lot of the stories in your book deal with children. Uh, and... It, there, there's some of the scariest ones in the book and so many iconic horror novels and films also kind of have a, you know they deal with kids what do you think it is about children that make them such effective characters in horror fiction i think um it's w when you put together evil on a child if the child is uh, evil because it's broken, because he he or she has been broken, because she because the child was um, uh, damaged by adults or by a situation or, or or whatever and became like a bad child, that is very scary. And if the child is bad, if the child is evil, that kind of destroys your notions of innocence and uh, and what we kind of tend to believe that we are born nice and then we become uh whatever we become it's like uh you, you know it's like an original sin like for real original sin of badness so i think that uh is very unsettling also it's very unsettling a child that can harm you because we we think of child of children of only being vulnerable and not children reacting and um so that's kind of scary um also i think there's like a a very double especially in latin america it's a very latin american thing or, or let's say very poor country thing but in latin america because the inequality is so harsh and so obvious. We have to learn to live with the reality of that. For example, in my country, Argentina is a, is a poor country, but still you can come to Buenos Aires and have a very decent life and it's a very uh, beautiful city and whatever. Still 50% of children are poor. Mm. And of that percentage of children, many live in the streets. 
and many big industries and many are you know uh they have to go through everything that goes uh with the fact that you're living in abandonment and um what people have to deal with this is the real horror of uh not paying attention to it ignoring it to keep on living because you really can be empathic with every child that you see in this situation you can there's too many and there's many in, in all Latin America. Brazil famously had even the uh, the squad to get the, the the streets clean of children for certain sporting events. This is a true story, and it could be material for a horror story. Um, and at the same time, as especially in the middle classes, there's a, you know a discourse about childhood that is absolutely devoid of uh, any kind of darkness and it's kind of the child that comes first the child has to be protected the ch ch childhood is the best uh part of life and it's like you're a hypocrite it's not and it's not because you know in a couple of hours maybe a child rings my bell and it's asking me for food and me and i'm in a nice part of buenos aires but they're in the street in the pandemic under the rain and um so that's why I, I i i meant about using you know a bit of politics and a bit of things that come from the genre of course children in horror are very useful in a lots of ways because they speak to us and they're scary for many reasons just in general uh, you know um rules let's say but also there's a problem here with childhood that is not addressed as it should be or is ignored because we can't go on with our lives in any other way and the two things when they collide you know the the thing to me is that maybe someone from a different culture can read them as you know horror fiction with children that is a very common thing but if you read it from here um it's different that's also why why I put there a, a short story that has uh, children from Barcelona when Barcelona used to be uh, or used to have a neighborhood that was very harsh and very poor that now is a very touristic neighborhood because also comes with that idea of psychogeography that place now is a, like a very super touristic place and it has a terrible past and I always thinking that that past is still there is still hidden there and that past involved children in a massive way. That's really fascinating. That's yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to actually uh, ask kind of both of you. There are elements of of humor, dark humor, uh, but in in both your books. And I want to ask both of you: Is it hard to walk that line between horror and humor, or is it is it easy for you to to sort of uh, incorporate those two? You know, incorporate the humor rather into the horror. Is that something that comes natural, or is it? You know, do you find yourself kind of walking a tightrope, as it were, when you do that? Um, Go on, Steve. For me, for me, um, horror and comedy or horror and humor, I guess, are there are two sides of the same coin. Like you build a joke the same way you build a scare. You have tension, tension, tension release, you know. And um, I think that's why people like Jordan Peele or John Krasinski or David Gordon Green are able to come into horror cinema with their comedy background and be so successful because they understand that tension, tension, tension release dynamic that horror needs. But um. Um, the way I like to use horror, I mean, comedy, humor in my horror fiction is as a pressure release valve. If like horror wants to climb, 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 like, um, there's one, there's, um, a werewolf. Now there's six werewolves. Now there's a whole world of werewolves. It wants to get worse and worse, you know, and really soon it plateaus into just a, 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 a keen, a screech. And the reader, the audience is kind of numb to that. You need up and downs, like Kurt Vonnegut says, you know, and, you get those up and downs when the horror gets scary and then you have a laugh and it goes back down, it resets. And then you climb again and the comedy resets it and you go down and you climb again and you, then you're going up in spikes. And that's what horror can do. Um, the trick is you don't want to have like too much levity in your horror because then it becomes, a, it's not like horror has to be serious all the time, but um, there are mortal stakes and you don't want to be flip about people's lives, you know? 
I completely agree. So to add mm -hmm. something, in particular, sometimes in my fiction, what appears is mm -hmm. very much of the grotesque. And the grotesque can be funny because it's kind of an exaggeration. And humor, you know, comedy can be also, of course, an exaggeration of those mm -hmm. things. So yeah. um, to me, the grotesque comes very naturally. And, um, you know, the, the Stephen was saying you have to, it's not necessarily to be uh, serious, but yes, this, um, you don't want to make people a laughing matter. This, you know, there's, there's something to say about that. Something, jokes are nice, but make someone a joke is different. So uh, that line, when humor starts to be cruel or grotesquery starts to be, you know, um, a kind of a, you know, a parade of monstrosities to exhibit someone, that's, that's different. And that's a line I think that we have to deal with. Absolutely, yeah. The, um, it, you know, horror also seems to be a natural genre, and uh, Mariana, you kind of talked about this earlier, but a natural genre for, for addressing trauma, you know, political trauma, historical trauma, racial trauma. Why do you think it, it is such a good fit for talking about that? Because uh, it, it seems like it, it addresses those things so uh, successfully, or can, you know, not always, but can address those things in a way that maybe mainstream fiction just, just can't uh, sometimes. You know, it hits, it hits a, a different chord anyway. Um, so what, why do y'all think that is? Is there a, a, what is it intrinsic in the genre that you think makes that such a good fit? To me, it's because sometimes, um, let's see, let's say mainstream fiction or realistic fiction, you know, journalism, whatever, sometimes it's not enough mm. to portray the real horror. Sometimes reality needs something that is not a, a genre that is, you know, um, a mirror of reality or tries to mirror reality to make it real. I don't know really how to put it, maybe don't have enough the vocabulary, but I can tell you like a little example of, of a short story that maybe it's illustrative of this. Um, there's a short story of mine that's in, in the other book, it's called The Dirty Kid, and um, they kill a boy, a young boy in that story. Oh, a body of a young boy appears, assassinated, and it's very cruel and horrendous, the crime. And you don't have no idea how many people came to me and said, how can you be so sick to think about doing that to a child? And you know, the crime is real. I copied the things that were done to that child's body almost without changing a word from, you know, from a journalistic piece that I liked, and I liked how it was written so i almost used that as the description of the of, of the, how the body was found and that crime in particular was a crime that was very um publicized here because it was kind of a ritual murder probably associated with narco and argentina is not a country that has that problem in particular it's more it is it has but not as the same in the same extent so it had a lot of publicity. I mean, it was not something I discovered. It was something that the readers forgot about because there was too much of it on the television because mm -hmm. it became, you know, kind of a... And sometimes, I guess, horror fiction, because of the the craft you can give to how you tell it, can give you a focus and can give you a slap in the face or can put a light on it that is totally different. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that that is why it's useful to me, at least. And I think I realized doing it more than thinking about it before. But doing it, I, I realized like, wow, like people really react to these things. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. Um, like if, if I wanna tell a story about um, a corrupt, wealthy upper class, um, taking all the resources from a lower class and leaving them in a bad place, then people are going to read that and they're going to be like, I live here. I don't want to read about this. You know, this is reminding me of where I am right now. But if I write a story about um, these elite vampires who are using people like cattle, I'm getting across the same dynamic. And I think I'm leaving the reader with the same feeling and maybe polarizing in them in the same way. But I'm doing it hopefully in a way that entertains them that um that 
like seduces them across to that idea instead of pushes them deeper into their own reality. But then they lead the story or whatever it is with um, those feelings, you know, and hopefully maybe they apply them to the, to their world. Maybe, maybe they don't, or to bring it to a more personal level. Um, I could write a story about um, me and my dad watching basketball on a Sunday afternoon and my uncle gets drunk and lurches down the road and kicks our door down and fights with my dad and throws furniture and breaks the living room up. And that's going to be like, um, I don't know, trauma drama or something, you know, but I can write a story about my dad not watching basketball and a zombie lurches through the door. My dad has to fight that zombie and that tears up the living room. And that's going to give us the same feelings, but in an entertaining way, you know, and um, I'm just, I'm just big. I think, one of our main jobs as writers is to to do like good in the world and not damage not damage the world, but also to provide people an escape and some entertainment, you know. And it's easy to forget that. It's easy to have a checklist of I want to address the politics of identity, I want to address repatriation, I want to address this atrocity. Um, but you've got to remember that um, people don't come across the room for um, celery on a tray they come across a room for cake and you've got to put a lot of icing on that cake to make people want to mm -hmm. go across the room to it you know yeah absolutely i don't mean to i don't i don't, I don't mean to bad talk celery maybe some people like celery a lot <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure it has its fans uh, <laughs> and, uh, by the way just a reminder to everyone watching if you have uh questions for for steven and or mariana you can put them in that q a box top right of your screen um, so in, in both your books, the, the setting is, is a really important element. You know, Mariana and a lot of the stories uh, in, in your book take, take place in Argentina. And uh, Stephen, your book takes place in Montana. Um, can you talk about the importance of setting in horror, whether it's, you know, say Camp Crystal Lake, you know, from Friday the 13th or, yeah. you know, the, the, the main towns in, in Stephen King's work? Uh, how is that, you know, an, an important factor, is it, for uh, for horror fiction and your books in particular? To me, to put it short, because really, to me, it's kind of, to me, they're characters. And I treat them as as characters, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, characters, I mean, you know, characters react to each other, and many of my of my human characters react to, to where they are and have to, you know, negotiate a, a relationship to to their place, and to me, you know, place is is very important, and to me, to locality is is very important. I mean, I never, I never really liked fiction that blurs the the locality to make it easier to me. I like to don't understand what it is, and now that I can investigate easier, you know, like you know, try to check what it is, but I like to feel lost about it a bit too, like what, what, what is this? I think it's the experience of fiction needs that. I don't like it when they make it easy for me. Um, for example, just, you know, a little thing. Uh, I'm a very big fan of the Brontes, and when I was little, I wasn't, uh, you know, reading in English at about when I started reading them at eight or nine or something. I didn't have the level of English to read them. And I remember reading Wuthering Heights and I had, and in my book, there was no translation of more. I don't know what would be, what would be the precise translation of more in Spanish, it would be paramo, maybe, but it's not exactly a paramo, it's something else that is particular to the English thing. So it said more, <laughs> I have no idea what it was. And I loved the book. And I realized it was kind of, you know, I. This descriptions of the place and you kind of have an idea but I never saw it and uh, for I don't know a year or two you know I'm 47 so when I was little there were enc encyclopedias and stuff and many didn't have pictures and I found one with a picture and it was a picture of a moor and it wasn't the way I imagined it but it was very easy to put that in the fiction and so that was the lesson I think a, a literature lesson, you know, like write your place, write the play, and you know the reader is not taken aback because he doesn't know the place. The reader likes this, 
you know, like like this kind of, you know, it kind of, especially in 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 a horror genre, it, it likes the uh, something that the writer knows and that maybe he doesn't know. It's an invitation. Yeah, I I I, I you know, I, I I don't think I will ever stop writing about the, uh, you know my city or 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 my country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that, that made me remember, like in some of in some novels, I read about people being up in the heather, and I don't know what heather. I still don't know what heather is. <laughs> like I have no idea. <laughs> it's just like I don't know. It's like a unicorn daydream or something. I don't know what it is. But um, but I totally agree. Character is a place, and I never thought of myself as a place writer because for some reason I had a dichotomy in my head. Of, there's place writers and there's not place writers, I guess. And I always thought I was a not place writer. But then about five years ago, I wrote this. Um, I was trying to write this big detective novel and I wanted to have the, have it set against the backdrop of like a Kafka City X, you know, just a vague gray nothing like a backdrop, like just a cardboard cutout kind of place. And um, I got about 120 pages into that book and it was like pushing a boulder uphill. It was going nowhere. And that's usually not how writing a novel is for me. Usually it's just like you know, riding a big giant weasel down a mountain or something, you know, but, um, <laughs> um, and I couldn't figure out what was happening. And then I went home, I went to a book festival in West Texas in my hometown of Midland. And, um, they were, you know, chaperoning me around from place, from place to place. And I got to looking up and I realized this is the city. This is where the story happened. So I went home, I restarted, the, restarted the novel, set it in that place. And the novel just told itself, you know, and I'm, it became real for me. And as for places like, I don't know, function and horror fiction, I'm not sure what all those chimes are. They're kind of neat. <laughs> but um, Anyways, um, I think in horror fiction, to scare the reader, you have to, um, or for me to be scared, I have to maintain the possibility in my head that this is my world, you know, that there's actually vampires or werewolves in my world. And so when, when horror fiction is set in some like fantasy landscape, I'm like, well, so what? It doesn't matter. That's, that's for them. But when it's set in something that could be contiguous with my reality, then it becomes scary. Then it can bleed over. It can bleed under the wall and come into my room. And that's scary. So I think it is important for me to have horror be um, particular, if not real, you know? Yeah. That's great. So um, we got a, have a question from a viewer from uh, David. And David is asking, are there any recent horror films that you two would recommend, especially movies that didn't get much attention? And I would add books to that, too. Any uh, horror films, horror books that have come out that maybe were, you know, weren't massive hits, but that you, that, that you all would recommend? Let me think. Um, massive books. I, I I don't know if new books or or whatever, but there's a there's a, a writer from Ecuador that's called Monica Ojeda. She's going to release the her first novel in in English soon, and it's called uh, Jawbone. This mandibula is called Jawbone, isn't it? It's very weird. It's had creepy pasta kind of thing, and and also very latin american i don't know she's young she's 30 something she's a bomb that is in a new thing old old thing i'm re-reading -re -re clive barker and he's a genius <laughs> i read it when i was young and i don't think i understood completely what what he's doing with the body and with everything and i don't know in movies i'm in a big kick of this i just realized that there is a kind of Top genre of um, horror and caregivers, horror and caregiven, horror and uh, disease, taint, mod, relic, um, the taking of Deborah Logan that is not very good, but it has some kind of scary things. And I just saw one that is in Texas, actually, that is The Dark and the Wicked. Um, it has, to me, a bit too many jump scares, but there's two or three things that absolutely spooky and gave me nightmares. I also am having a lot of nightmares because of the pandemic, so don't pay that much attention to that. But it's a, it's a, there's many, many, um, you know, uh, 
movies I've seen recently that are thinking about the body and the taking care of the body and the caring for someone in general as a horrific situation. And I think that it's a very um, daring place to go for horror when it works and when it doesn't. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the best horror things I've found recently is Carmen Maria Mercado's The Lola Woods. It's a six issue comic series, I guess, but limited series recently issued as a, you know, a trade paperback or a trade hardback. Um, and that to me just works exactly as horror should work. It's so it's, it's really interfacing with a lot of the stuff that um, Promising Young Woman does kind of, you know, really, really good. Um, forthcoming books, Chuck Wendig has the book of accidents coming out. It's kind of like a haunted house novel, just the idea of house is a little bigger and that, that novel moves. It's, really really dynamic um as for movies i wish everybody in the world would have seen freaky i love freaky i like comedy horror that's really what that is it's freaky friday if it was a slasher you know and um it came out during the pandemic so it kind of just went straight to video or streaming um blood quantum the zombie um zombie movie that jeff barnaby did out of canada is really good it's um what if a zombie pandemic or came and um, natives were the only ones who were immune, you know? Um, we would be the ones with the resources and it's really strong. Um, I like The Hunt a lot. That was last year, I guess. That was at the front end of the pandemic, The Hunt. Um, Becky came out during the pandemic, which is Kevin James, Paul Blart. You wouldn't think he'd do a horror movie, but I think he had a pretty good horror movie, Pandemic. It's about a little girl fighting off these killers. So basically it's Home Alone, I guess, except with a lot more blood, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> you know, uh, speaking of the pandemic, and we, we kind of talked to you email about this, but we, I guess the question I have is what uh, horror fiction and, and film and literature has been popular, state popular during the pandemic. I mean, I've been turning to it a lot. What do you, what does it do? Why do you think when we're, when we're in the middle of this terrifying event, why do you think people are, are 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 looking to horror fiction? You know, why do they maybe like to be scared? Because like I, uh, you know, it's just it's it's such a different world, and yet we're still, you know, when we're looking for an escape, or at least some of us, you know, turning to horror. And do you have any ideas of, of why that might be? I have no I idea. I wonder if it's I'm not because horror, but I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if it has something to do with um, horror, like a horror movie or a horror novel. It lets us process through from the beginning all the way to the end, like from the start of the tunnel to the daylight at the end of the tunnel, you know, and in the pandemic, we're in the tunnel, you know, and we want some confirmation that there's a light down there and a two hour horror movie about somebody struggling through that tunnel, like conditions us to see that, oh, we're in the middle now, but there is an end, you know, or it could be that horror stories give us like we feel this penetrating unease coming from all sides right now, you know, from the political climate, from the world, the, the environment falling apart, from the pandemic, from everything, you know, and um, horror movies give us a reason like, oh, it's werewolves, werewolves, werewolves are scary, and you feel like rational for, uh, for two hours or six hours to read a book or whatever, you feel rational, like, oh, I'm scared of werewolves, this is, this is a natural thing. Then you go back out in the world and you're like, oh yeah, everything's scary. <laughs> but it feels good for a little bit to to <laughs> like corner that fear, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, I think you're right. And in, in you know, over the last four years, it have been, you know, before January anyway, uh, we're at yeah. a very fright time for America too. And I, I yeah. wonder if, uh, yeah. you know, I wonder if the the last presidential administration, you know, had anything to do with with people turning to horror. Uh, yeah. I, 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 well, I think. You know, but, I, I, I do think that the, the the previous administration, what we saw on the news day after day were bad actors getting away without punishment, you know, and and I think that's I think the slasher is kind of experiencing a little bit of a rise right now, because what the slasher um, tells us is the world is fair. If you do wrong, Jason Voorhees is going to stand up behind you and come at you, you know, yeah. in the slasher world. It's a very, it's a brutal world, but it's a very fair world. And so slash, the slasher dynamic becomes like wish fulfillment for us, a fantasy world we can retreat to when the world we live in is not fair. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I um, we got another question from a viewer. Uh, Banyan asks, 
uh, things that are horrific can be subjective uh, to only particular people or demographics. What techniques have you used to make horror accessible for people outside of those cultures or communities or worldviews? That's a tricky question to me because um, I like to write within the, the, the genre, but I don't think I'm a very technical horror writer. I mean, I do I do know some, you know, in some, some technical things, but 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 really, to me, it's like a it, it's more like a like language, you know. Yeah. I speak the language of of, of, of of horror like very fast. My eye, my my emotions, everything turned that way in a, in in different uh, situations and even subgenres in different period in different periods of, of of my life. And I don't know. Um, so I don't think I ever wrote horror for the horror community or outside the horror community or trying to bring people in. I think sometimes my books, especially, um, it's weird because as you are in translation, you're automatically put in the kind of a literature kind of thing. You, you, know, you know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's um, I guess it's easier from someone that comes. It makes me much more, uh, <laughs> sophisticated than I am, you know, because I am, I, I come from in, 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 in translation country, it's kind of, it's a paradox. And here, you don't realize, as I was saying before, there's not really a market, there's not a place, you, you know, that you go in, you, if you go in a bookshop, the, the horror section is Stephen King yeah. and, and nothing else. And uh, it's not like a local horror thing. So there's, you know, there's writers like me or, or many others, especially from this generation, there's the generation that was young in the 90s that consumed all the kind of horror thing in the 80s that kind of changed a lot of literature in Spanish. But still there's not, you know, the, the shelf where we are. So that that's, I don't, I don't really have that kind of uh, the only thing I have is people asking me for ages now, I'm, you know, when I'm going to grow up to literature and then, you know, to something more, <laughs> you know, more serious. Um, and it's been the other way around to me, like my first two novels are very mainstream, kind of, you know, they have grotesque and kind of nasty things, but they're not genre, genre novels. And I grew up to horror, let's say, not the other way. And um, so that's the only thing I get, you know, that, that still I, I get that the prestige is not here. But I don't really care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I had someone ask me once early in my career, because my first two or three books were also what they call literary. And somebody asked me, they said, um, I did a horror novel. And they said, yeah, that was kind of a fun rock, but when are you going to do something serious again, you know? And I, and um. And to me, horror is serious. You know, I also feel like I speak the language of horror. That's my first language. Um, so yeah, it's it's less about growing up and it's more about coming home for me, <laughs> you know, coming home to horror. That's where I feel like I live. Um, as for how to make it accessible to other people, um, I f if, if there is a, a way, it's not a technique, but um, I think if you can, if you can scare the reader, like a lot of people have found the only good Indians who aren't horror readers, but if they feel that spike of fear, then hopefully I'm luring them over into the horror aisle for a couple hundred pages, you know? And, and um, I think if you can activate people's fear, then you can make them into a horror reader for a little bit, you know, and maybe even get them addicted. And then they buy more and more horror books and then, then they start wearing hockey masks and, going to conventions yeah. and everything, you know? <laughs> yeah. Go a whole lot. But I think we have time for one more question, and we've got one from Maria, who's asking, uh, what other art, not necessarily horror, is resonating with you and influencing you right now? It could be music, TikTok videos, poems, paintings, whatever. Um, for me, it's poetry a lot. Um, I read a lot of poetry really like um uh, poetry in my language 
especially from Chile. Chile has the greatest poets in, in Latin America. No wonder they have two Nobel Prizes, but the, really the state puts a lot of money there. It's like, it's absolutely crazy and they get really, really good stuff. But I also like Rambo and the decadence and, you know, Baudelaire is this kind of thing. You can, I can, you know, it's very oblique whereby that those kind of very literary references are a bit in my, in what I do. And, um, and music. I'm I'm a music fan. I'm most I, I always wanted to be you know I, I wanted to be like uh, more a rock star than a writer. The thing is I did, I didn't you know I'm awful at it. But I like um, m music in 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 general. I mean I I can I, I don't want to see say one artist. But I, li I like rock and roll and I like you know I like. Uh, yeah, I, 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 music for me is really important. For me, Nick Cave is my favorite artist in anything. I mean, if you tell me what, which is your favorite artist, Nick Cave, uh, you know, I wouldn't say uh, it's not only the music, it's just the whole thing. And that's, you know, that's what I wanted to be when I was all my life. <laughs> Iggy Pop, maybe, if not Nick. <laughs> but th that's kind of my... That, that that's and that's very influential also in my in, in my writing not, not the the themes or anything but there's something about the intensity of music there's something about music to me that it's um it comes and it goes it disappears it's in the air it's very abstract to me it's better than than literature absolutely Stephen, is there anything you're listening to or, or reading that's a uh you know, kind of getting um, you through the pandemic. Well, you know, um, when Mariana was saying that, like, I, I'm the same way. When I was um, 12, 15, 17, I wanted to be a rock star. I, being a writer was the farthest thing from my mind. All I wanted to do was wear tights and put a lot of hairspray in my hair and, you know, be in a, a hair metal band. That was, that was my dream. I thought that was my future. And it didn't work out because I can't, I learned all the guitar chords, but they never add up to music. They never add up to music. You know, I don't, music is beyond, I don't understand how to make it. You know, that's fundamentally foreign alien to me um but anything i'm engaging yeah you know for this book i'm writing here or i wrote my heart is a chainsaw it's out in august um i had to go back not had to i got to go back and watch all the um late 70s early 80s on into the 90s slashers like all the um the ones that have been lost and everything just so i could have them in my head the right way so that's been my comfort food for the pandemic is just watching graduation day initiation night school um <laughs> visiting hours it's all those old ones that, that nobody cares about anymore you know yeah. that's really cool well, you know maybe we can all start a band uh after this a nick cave cover band <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i can't yeah. sing or anything but you know well all right well, um <laughs> We are coming to a close now. Uh, so I just want to say thank you so much to tuning in to supporting the San Antonio Book Festival. Uh, I want to thank everyone at the Book Festival, especially Clay Smith, uh, for putting all this together. And of course, so many, many, many thanks to Stephen and Mariana. Uh, this has been a great discussion. It's such a privilege to get to talk to you. And uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, finally, just a reminder, if you would like to buy Stephen and Mariana's books, uh, and you trust me, you really, really should, uh, please buy them at the, on the website. It benefits the Great Nowhere Bookshop. Uh, if you live in San Antonio, uh, Nowhere Bookshop does curbside pickup from Tuesday to Saturdays. You can go there, pick up lunch from 50-50, from make it a day. Uh, and really, no matter where you live, please support independent bookstores. It's, it's very important these days, especially. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. Thanks.